to see everybody this morning. We've got a super crowd and we've got visitors with us. We are so very, very thankful for the presence of each and every one. We are glad that you're here and hope that we can truly have a worship experience that will help us to grow in our strength and understanding of the Word of God and to help us to be able to order our priorities in a way that will be pleasing unto Him. You know, we've reached that time of the year when school is back in session. And for some, that's an exciting time, and they are smiling about it, and they're glad to be back in class. For others, not so much. But uh, we have all different arrangements in terms of both students, teachers, we have a lot of education people in the congregation here. Appreciate each and every one. But I want to talk about a balance that we'll be looking at as we go through the course of our lesson this morning. You know, schools have been around a long time. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 9, we find that there was one occasion in Ephesus when the apostle Paul wound up preaching from the school of Tyrannus. He had some opposition at the synagogue, and so that was the location from which he taught for a good period of time. And as our kids are going back to school, they now have all of those obligations that go along with serving the Lord and trying to balance school at the same time. Because schools are wonderful in many ways. In fact, it is a result of our schooling that we try to prepare for life. We try to learn those skills that will help us to be successful. Schools are busy with the teaching of the reading, writing, arithmetic, and other assorted subjects that are designed to help us to function well within our society. A good education can offer the keys to success and that it can prepare us for a whole array of different opportunities. And our ed a good education can give us choices in life as to what we choose to do and how we want to pursue in our lives. And so for the next 12 years or more, Many folks are going to be highly consumed with mastering the educational material that is set before them. To a child growing up at home, that kind of becomes their job in a sense. The idea of getting the homework, getting the obligations that go along with being prepared for each day of their school. And there are all kinds of other supplemental things that schools will use to try to make their programs even more attractive. They have sports programs and various clubs of one sort or another. You got the bands, you got the chorus, you've got the friendships that are made. You've got all kinds of things that keep taking bigger and bigger and bigger portions of your time. And the problem that happens is that we can develop too much, I believe, of an attachment we can become too attached to a worldly path of living. In other words, these opportunities are not wrong in and of themselves, and they help us in our growth and in our development. But sometimes, whether we're talking schooling or later on in life, the job that we choose, we can wind up making a choice that just consumes all of our time and all of our energy. And so all of our thought process is devoted to this world and to the things of it. John gave us a warning about that over in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. He said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know, while we see the importance of all of this, getting the education, getting a good job, providing for our families. This isn't all that there is to it. You know, whenever the school and whenever sports and jobs, when all of that becomes our life, to the exclusion of spiritual things, things have gotten out of balance. We can become very obsessed with the things that 
school or with the things on the job as we mature into adults and suddenly we miss out on what is really the most important. And that's where I want to focus this morning. How do we choose that which is the most important? Solomon in his wisdom helped us understand our purpose in life over in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Going down to about verse uh, 13. He was helping us kind of get some perspective. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For of this is the whole duty of man. We have an obligation to please God first and foremost. And that we're going to have to strive to please God while we're living a life here on the earth. And so we're going to have to blend these things in that spiritual instruction from God is going to be tempering the choices that we make in this life. Over in Luke chapter 10, Jesus gave an illustration that helped us to kind of see the reality of how it all boils down when it's all said and done. In Luke chapter 10, beginning in about verse uh, 38, we find here that Jesus is uh, making the point as he is kind of helping to balance things out. He's come to the house of Mary and Martha. And Martha sees the importance of getting a meal cooked and entertaining and taking care of the chores around the house. But Mary has a different perspective. Here in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 38, <coughs> now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much sermon, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Mary had an interesting spirit of thing. She wanted to hear what Jesus could teach her at the time that was possible for her to so learn. And yes, there was a need to get something to eat, but that was far subservient to the most important thing of learning spiritual things. So many times, I've seen youngsters as they grow up trying to, to juggle this decision of what's most important, what do I need to do? I've got homework tonight, so I can't come to church. Or I've got some other school activity, and there's no way for that to be rearranged. And so even though it may happen early in the afternoon or later in the evening, I guess I'll have to skip church so I can get there on time. And oftentimes the most important instruction that we need is the instruction that gets left out. In John chapter 6 and verse 63, Jesus is talking about the magnitude and power of what he said. He said, it's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. We need to be able to hang on to every one of those pieces of instruction that we can get. And oftentimes what happens, I've seen it over and over again. Somebody may have a question, and they're really wishing that, that I preach a sermon on a certain topic, or that a certain, a certain passage of Scripture might get discussed in a Bible class because it's something you don't quite understand. It's something that they want to master, and so, so they want to learn that. And so maybe they'll even request a sermon. And so... I'll work it in into the next available slot that I've got, and I may preach on it. But guess what? That may be the one service that they just had a headache and need to take on. And then, did you ever get around to preaching that service? Yeah, I did. But where were you? You know, and I re 
realize that there can be sickness that, that infringes. That can't be avoided. But oftentimes, we just were only coming in a haphazard fashion, and when what we needed was presented, we weren't there to get it. So that's why every opportunity is a benefit to us, and why the Hebrew writer encourages us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It's a chance to be provoked into love and good works, to learn what we need to know. But if we suddenly got attached over here, and we're busy living life, and taking care of the stuff over here, we miss out on the stuff over here that we need to get a hold of. Because in reality, one day, all of this is going to pass away. One day, there's not going to be any more need for a school, for a job, or for this world at all. Jesus made the point in the course of his teaching over in Matthew chapter 24 that there's coming a very special day in which this world will be no more. But this is not going to go on. Over in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that they were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying, and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We're going to keep living life. We're going to keep making our choices and doing our thing. But one day that's going to be grossly and majestically interrupted. Either by the Lord's return or by the fact that we no longer are going to be drawing a breath in our days here in this time. Over in 2 Peter chapter 3, going down to verses 9 and 10, Peter makes the point that while we may not think about it much, this day of destruction and that judgment day is coming. 2 Peter 3, beginning of verse 9. Peter said, The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, into which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Whenever that day comes, the diploma that we worked so hard to get, that college degree that opened so many doors of opportunity for us, maybe the great financial successes that we had in this life, that's all going to mean absolutely nothing. Because it's going to be left behind. This world is going to be gone. And what remains is what priority do we put over here? To the word of God and to our study of it and to our obedience to it. You see, from the very beginning, the Bible helps us to understand that God gave us a soul. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, it talks about God breathing into man's nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And while this body is going to wear out and pass away, that soul is going to continue on eternally somewhere. Over in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus talked about it, beginning in about verse 24. He is explaining one of the parables that he has taught to, to his apostles. They came back and didn't quite understand the parable of the tares that he had spoken unto them. And in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 16, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, 
If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The preface to that parable, we'll get back to it in a minute. Jesus is talking about the importance of this soul that you have. There's nothing else that you have that's any more important than it. And so then he talked about that judgment day back in Matthew 13, if we move back a couple of chapters, beginning in about verse 36. Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said to them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that soweth them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered together and burned into fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them that do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. And there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus, in the later chapters, talked about the value of this soul, and then said, one day, you're going to be judged as to what you did with that. Because this soul is going to spend eternity somewhere. Either in the blessed rest of heaven, or in the torments of, of hell, as Jesus expe- explained it there in Matthew chapter 13. So this world is not all that there is. And when all of our attention focuses here, unfortunately we can be unprepared for what rests beyond this one. Now at the judgment day, we're going to be, the scriptures tell us, we're going to give an account of what we have done in this life. The choices that we made, the things that we did, and also those things that we chose not to do. Over in Romans chapter 14, Paul in talking to the Romans said in the last part of verse 10, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So that every one of us shall give account of himself unto God. There's no getting around it. It will be a judgment for each and every one. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, Paul tells the Corinthians, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that that he has done, whether it be good or So just how prepared have we made ourselves for what rests beyond these days of life? What priorities have we set? The scriptures are clear that God loved us so much that he made arrangements for us to be able to have forgiveness of the mistakes that we make in this life so that one day heaven can be our home. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and going down to verse 3, Paul told the Corinthians, he says, By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was that perfect sacrifice. He paid a price that no other man could pay. Because Romans tells us that all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us were perfect enough to be the sacrifice for sin. But Jesus was. He lived all of his days here, the Hebrew writer tells us, and was tempted in all manners like as we are. Yet he was without sin. And so with that being the case, We have an obligation to appreciate, I think, that which he has done. In Hebrews chapter
chapter 4 was the verse I was quoting in verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the healing of our infirmities, but in all points was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So he laid down his life. He paid the price. He paid the path so that our soul can spend eternity in a place called heaven. And he offers the invitation to all men. To come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. And as we look to the scriptures, we see, especially from the book of Acts, story after story after story given to us of the conversion of individuals who were living busy lives, who had commitments in this world, but they understood the importance of getting ready for this. And that is going to begin by our having some understanding of what the Bible says. There, factually speaking, there are a lot of folks who don't know squat about the Bible. They've not studied it. They've not heard it discussed very much. They've not had any interest in it. And as a result, when I start talking about a judgment day, the importance of the church, Christ dying for their sins, and other Bible stories, you just kind of get a quizzical look. Because they don't know anything about it. But as we study the scriptures and hear it discussed, we can develop faith in the God that loved us and the Son that died for us. Over in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It is our study of the scripture that will explain to us exactly what we need to do. Now we have the option of embracing what the Bible says or throwing it aside. But if we can truly bring ourselves to accept the evidence and believe Jesus is the Son of God, now we're moving in the right direction. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in the him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Sadly for many, they've been taught that that's all you do. As long as I believe in Jesus, everything's going to be okay. But that's not all that the scriptures say about us and the choices we need to make. Over in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, Paul was preaching to a very educated audience as he was there on Mars Hill. But they didn't know much about serving God. They even had an idol of the unknown God. There's a lot of this they hadn't figured out yet. And so Paul preaches to them about the great God of heaven. And he says in verse 30, the time of this ignorance God winked at but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. We've got to decide I'm going to try to be the best person I can be and live a life of righteousness. I'm going to skew or turn away from sin, to turn my life around and be more what God wants me to be. And as we come to that conclusion that the Bible record is true, that God's love for us was immeasurable, that his son died for us, then we're prompted to understand that there are more things that I need to do. I turned my life around, that's all great. But have I actually declared my faith in him? Over in Romans chapter 10, going down to verse 10, it says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We need to have the courage to confess, yes, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And sometimes that's a costly confession. There have been stories of religious persecutions of individuals who simply were asked the question, do you believe in Jesus? And they were saying it at gunpoint. And if they said yes, they pulled the trigger. Do we have a strong enough faith Declare our faith in the Lord, even though it may cost us something. Over in Acts, or John chapter 12, we find that there were some individuals there, some of the priests and religious leaders, it says in verse 42. It says, Nevertheless, among many of the, the chief rulers, they believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. To them, the Christ.
lives of confessing their faith in Christ was socially unacceptable. It was asking too much. But in Acts chapter 8, verse 37, whenever that Ethiopian understood that Jesus was the Son of God, because Philip had preached unto him Jesus, he said, what does hinder me to be baptized? He said, if you believe, you may. And he confessed, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the same confession that Peter had made back over in Matthew chapter 16 and going down to about verse 18. And we find Jesus responding to that in a very positive way. Jesus said in verse 17, Jesus, well, let's back up to verse uh, 16. Simon Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood is not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, upon this confession that you just made, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we see a progression here. We hear the word and we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We resolve to live the best life that we can, turning from sin. We have the courage to confess our faith in him. But does that end it? It's not according to Jesus. In Mark 16 and verse 16, he said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He made that a necessary condition to our salvation. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Whenever we find Paul or the apostles, Peter and the others, preaching that Jesus indeed was the Son of God, the resurrected Savior, they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, He'd already preached the sermon, they heard it and believed it. He said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Why? In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Holy Ghost. Whenever Saul of Tarsus was converted and became the Apostle Paul, he saw the Lord on the road on the way to, to Damascus. And he's told to go into the city and he would be told what he must do. He's been praying and fasting for three days. And the Lord tells Ananias to go talk to him. So praying and fasting and, and a religious experience could have saved him. Saul should have been in good shape. Ananias came to him at the direction of the Lord and said in verse 16, Why tarriest thou? Acts chapter uh, 22. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If all the praying and fasting had fixed everything, there wouldn't have been sins there to be washed away. And we find that individuals who obey these steps that are repeated over and over and over again, especially throughout the book of Acts. It said in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 that they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. This is the church that he promised to build over there in Matthew chapter 16. This is the church that he purchased with his own blood. As the Apostle Paul reminded the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, he told them to take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And if we'll be faithful unto death, we can have that crown of righteousness. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. There was a reason that Christ died on the cross and shed his blood. It was for the remission of our sins. It was for the building of his church. And so we see the priority system that we've got to adopt if we want to go to heaven and die. Yes, we're going to be busy with life. But as we live our lives, each decision is going to be tempered by the instruction from the Word of God. So that whenever we give an account in the day of judgment for the life that we've lived and the choices that we've made, we can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because as you lived your life here, you also took care of this. So heaven can now be your home. And so my big question this morning is are you ready I know within the 
sound of my voice. There are folks who have not yet been baptized in the remission of their sins. It's not something that I can make happen. It's got to be your decision. But at the same time, if your life is all over on this side of the ledger, and spiritual things are only a hobbyistic expectation, some I dabble in once in a while, but certainly not something very important, one day we will learn how important it is. And we'll learn it the hard way. And you have to say, depart from me. I never knew you. I wish there was something I could say to do. But I can't be any more persuasive than the words of Scripture. We've seen what we need to do. The path that needs to be incorporated into our lives here so that heaven can be our home. But this morning, that decision is up to you. Everything is in readiness. And we would love to see you baptized into Christ Jesus today. The Apostle Paul told the Corinthians that now is the accepted time. And now is the day of salvation. James tells us that life's but a vapor. It appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And none of us have, as the old expression goes, a lease on life. For we know that there's going to be a tomorrow. So now you have a chance to take care of a very important priority.